I won't comment. Let's pray. <laughs> Lord Jesus, we are thankful uh, in this Thanksgiving period, Lord, we we are truly grateful for who you are in our lives and all the, the things you have done for us, to us and through us. And um, we, we just want to invite your presence now, Lord, as we speak uh, and share about our experiences of ministry, that your presence will be with us, Lord, that we will be an inspiration to, to someone listening um, and that your name will be glorified. But we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you both so much for coming. Uh, one of the things uh, it's been on my heart for so long is what does it look like to do ministry here? So, hey, guys, for those who are watching, my name is Velma Tim, and I do this uh, channel but with all the stories of missionaries. And today I have two incredible people that I respect a lot. Uh, here with me and they are all scholars so but then there are also people who love the Lord at times people want to dissociate scholarship from um, uh, intense relationship with God but that's at times it's good when that comes together so that's incredible so they are going to just uh, share with us uh, a lot I'm going to ask some questions and we are going to talk we're going to have conversations and what does it look like to be able to do ministry in the diaspora what does it look like to be a mi on missions here in America, they'll share their stories and we're going to also talk uh, from a broad perspective. So I want you to welcome with me, Reverend Dr. Susan Moriti and uh, Babatunde is, is Dr. Just do, just do Reverend Dr. Damit. Reverend Dr. Babatunde, there's other extra. So I call him my bishop because of, of, of that. So Reverend Dr. Babatunde, we're going to welcome them to this uh, session today. Um, I would like, do you want to just introduce yourself, say a little about who you are, and then we are going to continue from there. You want me to start? Yes. Yes, so my name is Baba Tunde Oladimeji. Uh, I'm from southwestern Nigeria, raised in Lagos. Uh, got to the U.S. in 2012 fully. Uh, and I have a family, my wife Lami Oladimeji from northern Nigeria. And we are blessed with four children, a girl, Sophia, and three boys, Jubilee, Jethro, and Jesse. Jubilee is 12, Jethro is nine, and Jesse is six. And we live in Chardon, Nebraska. We pastor with the United Methodist Church here in Chardon, Nebraska. Awesome. Thank you. Dr. Susan. Yeah, Susan Moriti, uh, originally from Kenya, um, married to Jeff, um, who is also a pastor here. We pastor churches in central Nebraska. I am in St. Paul, and he serves Wood River and Alder. We are blessed with two children, a freshman in college and a freshman in high school. Um, what else? Yep, yeah, that's it. That's it. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Uh, and one of the things I like is that both of you, your 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 PhD was in missions. So I think there's a lot you bring apart from just experience is the scholarly aspect. But let's first start. What does it look like to be on missions in North America? You want me to start? Yep. Because uh, Susan is more scholar than myself. But uh, she's been teaching for a while. I think that uh, I will borrow from the language of uh, Philip Jenkins, uh, who uh, wrote an, uh, a book, a book, book, which he called uh, The Next Christendom. And then from Andrew Walls, uh, late Andrew Walls, who had argued over the years that mission for, for us in those days, it used to be that the West goes to the rest, goes to different, they go to different part of the world. But it, they argued that the world was coming to America. And that so what people have carved different words, reverse mission, but the argument is that the world is presently in America. And rather than just focusing on America or the West sending people out, the world has come to the doorstep of the missionary. 
And so what he needs to do is to begin to articulate how, what that will look like rather than just thinking about going out there, but to say what, what is happening around me, things are changing. And I think so that on that background, some of us who have come over here haven't learned those theories sitting down and say, oh, that, that is true. We have a lot of people from different parts of the world in our classroom, in our neighborhoods. And the argument is that you may not be able to go there and comfortably reach out to people. But now we are now in a free world in America where it's freedom of speech and you can reach out to people. And on that basis is where some of us begin to see that. We'll still talk more about that. Not easy, but that is the basis for which we do mission. Okay. Suzanne, do you have something to add to that? Yeah, just very little. I think Tunde has said it very well. Um, I, I think I would just add that there was an erroneous understanding, um, especially stemming from Christendom, that um, you know, missions was coming from one place to the other. Uh, but now missions is from everywhere to everywhere. And um, I think the reason why they had that uh, faulty understanding is because in Christendom, when the king or the leader of a country said, I'm a Christian and you all are Christians, everyone was understood to be a Christian. And so that happened in the West a lot, especially in European countries. And um, they really did not see it as um, coming down to specifics to the people, to relationships, uh, to people living out rather than being, um, you know, told that you have converted because your king has converted. And so there is really no place that doesn't need missions. I think it's anywhere that the word of God needs to be told, sometimes anew and sometimes um, again, because people have become complacent to the faith. Wow, that's awesome. As Yeah, it's just, you both are talking, I'm like, wow, I'm, I live in a neighborhood of less than 12,000 and we have about 46 different nations. Wow. And lots of people from the 1040 we know that going there would be just so tough or risky for a missionary. But yeah, like they are behind my house. And yeah, that's good. Okay, so let's dive to the second question. What does America, oh no, let me reverse that. Does America need missionaries? Does Europe need missionaries? And, um, and do they need specifically African missionaries? I know that's like a... <laughs> I'm going to push it first to Susan because I know that our dissertation was on discipleship and the rest of it. So I'm going to push that question first to her to bring out all the nuances uh, of that answer <laughs> to that question. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if it has anything to do with that, Tunde, but um, I, I think, honestly, when we start categorizing to America or Europe or Africa, we are missing uh, our focus because um, it's it's not necessarily a specific place. It's anywhere where the word of God needs to reach. And so it doesn't matter where that place is and it doesn't matter where those people are. Additionally, I think the world has increasingly become a global village so that there is no place that has just that people in it. So we have uh, British people living in America. We have Nigerians and Kenyans and Cameroonians and uh, people from the Middle East. And so if we say America, like who are we talking about? Because different people are living in different places as we have seen more more um, immigration and people moving from one specific place to the other. And, and, and do they need African missionaries? Again, it's not about the race. <laughs> I think it's about um, who, you know, God, whenever God introduces himself to us, it is always a privilege and a responsibility. So the privilege is that we have come to know God no matter where we are. And the responsibility is reach out to the next person, reach out to the neighbor. And so whether you're an African or you are 
a Middle Eastern person or you're a European, it's our responsibility. Um, we are blessed to be a blessing. I think that was um, right, I think. New Bunde, can you remind me the mission of God? Yeah, new big, uh, Christopher Wright. Christopher Wright, yes. Yeah. So we are blessed to be a blessing. Um, we, we when we once we know God, we have a responsibility to make sure that that message reaches to others. Yeah, thank. You. Oh, so thank you. I wanted to add more. You know, so so I I think that one of the reasons why people ask the question, do we need Africans in America? I look at it from a cultural perspective that each region has something to bring. Just like Paul talks about the gift of the body, there are different functions, different things that different parts of the body could bring. And the eyes will bring what the nose probably will not be able to bring and the ears and other parts of the body. So I will argue that the, the Africans have some peculiar things to bring to the body of Christ, which is important, just like Susan talked about, that wherever we are, we have been called to be a blessing. We've been saved to be a blessing. And so whereas in those days, it used to be this idea that, okay, all the Americans or the Westerners, they have all it takes. They are the people who have the knowledge. But now we've come to see that there are, because of some of the peculiar environments and experiences that we've had in Africa and other parts of the world, there is something we are bringing into the equation that may be difficult for someone from a different culture to grasp which is going to be very helpful. And, and some of us have talked about it at different places to say, for example, the, the Africans, the importance of prayer, dependence on God, it's very high because of the, the place since we live, you know, whereby you, you need to pray every time for everything. I, I said to people, I was raised in Lagos, Nigeria, and if my, my dad prayed almost Every time you get in the car, you have to pray. You get to where you're going, you have to pray. You get back in the car, you pray. And you get home, you pray. And so if you went out with my dad four times, you may have prayed for 16 times, apart from the one you did in the morning and the one you did in the evening. And someone in the West will say, why, why do you have to pray every time? Well, it's important that you got to your destination safely because there are so many things that can happen to you. Some drunk rider or driver can run into you. So many things can happen. So people tend to depend more on God. It is not a disadvantage, it's an advantage. And so when Africans bring that into the system here, it's supposed to be an addition to what is happening to the church, to strengthen the church in the West. So that's where I will argue that there is a need for missionaries from Africa who've had that experience to bring that to bear on Africans who are here. But more, more than that, other people who are not Africans, that they can also enjoy that privilege of praying and other things like that. As, as I listen to you both talk, I, I'm thinking of Matthew 28, where Jesus says, go, um, other versions say, as you go, make disciples mm -hmm. of all nations. So as Africans come here, as Americans go somewhere else, as Europeans travel, as long as you're a believer, make sure you take that. And we, when we bring that, we bring the gospel also from our cultural perspective. And mm -hmm. And it's a plus. It's a plus to wherever we go. It's a plus to whoever receives that message. Thank you, Bob. So what does ministry in the diaspora look like for, for, for you both? Maybe let's compare it with your home country. What way? What are some of the advantages? What are some of the challenges you've been through? How has it been ministry, doing ministry in the diaspora? So let me begin since she started the other one. Well, it's a long story. It depends on which, which area you want to look at. But I, think, I think there are things, uh, there are privileges or advantages of, of the West. For example, you know, internet, I don't have to pay special amount of money. You know, these are just normal things that people have. So communication, you are able to communicate to different parts of the world, access to resources, the library that you have behind you is a wonderful library there. Behind me is a library here. And even if you don't have, the church has a library. That there are in our little communities, there are libraries there. So you can have those to, to study. So those are advantages here that you may not have when you are back home. I will all I will say from my own experience, 
there are also disadvantages. I guess that back home, people are more enthusiastic about the gospel. They are hungry. And so people are ready to listen. Want to get the word of God out there. People will sit down like the story in Acts of Apostles where Paul was preaching till the night until someone fell down and, and passed out. You, you know, that is an experience that you can find in many parts of Africa. People hungry once you have the i remember t teaching classes the last time i was in nigeria I, I taught a class and we had it was a doctor of ministry class or something and we started the class in the morning we had a break for one hour the people left at at six they got back at eight we continued from eight till four in the morning you know teaching and you know we have our coffee our drinks people are just eager to learn uh, well that in my own experience, it's not as 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 that here. People are already comfortable. They're like, oh, that's enough. You know, I'll check it, I'll check it out later. I don't have to stress myself. So that can create a, a, a sense of frustration for people like me. Uh, and and I'm, I will argue Susan too, who have been in settings where you're teaching, you're preaching, you're traveling, and people are ready to receive. It's like they are dry like wood, and you set the fire there, they catch the fire. But in some of our settings, you're forcing people. You're like, I said to someone not too long ago, I said, you know, someone in my Sunday school class, fourth grade Sunday school class in the church where I was raised has a higher level of the Bible compared to some adults that I have met. You know, when adults don't know the difference between Paul and Jesus, or if there was anybody called Paul, you know, that is not an actor, he's not a, he's not a Hollywood star, he's just a person in the Bible. You know, you get frustrated and you see all the facilities, you see the resources. And so, and I'm not generalizing, but some of the people I've been exposed to, that's what I see, that you're kind of forcing yourself and that they're, they're satisfied with a two and a half, a 25 minute sermon. Uh, whereas, you know, in, in Lagos, Nigeria, someone is teaching for two hours and people are writing, you know. I'm used to taking a notebook to the church because when they are preaching, I'm taking notes. Here, you hardly, in my own experience, you hardly find people take down notes. They are just so, so those will be some of the challenges that I see. And then, of course, when we go to the issue of, of uh, differences in accent and culture and race, that could still be a problem in some places. Uh, uh, in the West and, and in America as it is, where someone doesn't see you enough as a pastor, you're not pastor enough, you know, compared to the other people that they know. That is what, that is getting better in some of our denominations like the United Methodist Church, uh, you know, Global Methodist Church and a few other places. But we know that there are other people who are really challenged where, you know, people are not accepting you as they will accept you. So when a missionary comes from the U.S. to Nigeria, they will welcome you and they will give you everything that you need. They treat you like a king. That's what we have learned to do. It's part of hospitality. Sometimes that's not what you get when the reverse is the case. You don't have those kind of hospitality that you get, that you give to your contemporaries when they come over there. So those will be some of the things I will say just top of my head. Hmm. Wow. Awesome. Yeah, I, th I think. Sorry. Oh no, go ahead. Yes. I think Tunde is so right. Um, on all those things and and how different. Um, I think the hunger that you mentioned is something that comes to my mind so quick. Um, how people are hungry for the gospel, for the preaching, for the teaching, and um. I mean, I know the hunger sometimes can result in um, in a disadvantage in a way because when people are so hungry, sometimes they are not even um, careful enough to check out what they are consuming. And so there is a likelihood for um, consuming erroneous messages. But, um, but, but people just want to know more about God. Um, the other big difference I have seen is, <laughs> so back home, um, I pastored congregations for 400, 500 people, several of them 
Um, and we were constantly trying to build bigger churches, trying to fundraise for that. Um, on the other side of the globe here, we have spectacular cathedrals um, with, gosh, how many people? Like, if if we wanted to take a seat by ourselves, everyone, we could, you know, and still have more space left. Um, and, and so that that is really, I mean, I appreciate the privilege of spaces and enough Sunday school classes Like you know, you can have children lesson here and you can have adult Sunday school here and you can have the youth rehearsing here. It's wonderful. Um, but also um, the, the numbers of people interested in investing uh, in their spirituality is not um, quite as much. Um, I, I think the, uh, the other thing, and, and Tunde mentioned this a little bit, is we, so we, we depend a lot on, um, just because of how our structures are, are set, we depend a lot on each other community. Um, it, and just that's how life is. That's how life is set. Um, but I think in in more developed countries, we we have a very, very self um, independence. You know, um, I gotta do what I gotta do. Uh, you're sick. You go to the hospital. You pay by your own insurance. Um, you you're hungry. You figure out how to feed your family. Um, back home, you will send your child and say, hey, go to Auntie Velma's home and tell her to put some flour for you in this bowl. I will go to the mail to get tomorrow and I will refund. <laughs> or or maybe because we we get this from each other all the time, that's it. Just tell her I got, I got some more guests tonight. And so that communal uh, life um, spills into the church and the self-independence spills here um which becomes really difficult for faith because especially the christian faith was was made to be done in community like uh jesus fashioned this to be done together um someone was saying wherever there is a you in the Bible, it's not you individual, it's you all, like <laughs> Kentucky, y'all thing. Um, so it's it's for everybody. And so um, I think also because of the many amenities and privileges people have here on how they they live, it's easy to mistake that for um self-sufficiency uh rather than uh, having a need for God. We, we can easily slip into thinking, oh, I have insurance, so I don't need prayers when I'm sick. I just need to go to the doctor and pay this amount of money. Um, and so it's a constant reminder to the people of faith in the developed world that, yes, yes, insurance is good and good doctors are good and good hospitals are good. But you know what? We need the divine hand for health. We need the divine hand for um, safety. I mean, it's things like the war that is going on right now that kind of jerks people into reality that it doesn't matter all these things we have, we actually need um, um, a divine intervention for life to go well. So those are some of the differences, like when Tunda was saying his dad would pray 16 times in a day, depending on how many places they visit. I think it's easier for people there to realize that they really need that um, than where systems are working. You know, when I feel insecure uh, here, I'm just going to call one 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 nine. Uh, is it nine, nine yeah, nine one one. Uh, whereby, uh, when Tunde is traveling from Lagos to that corner where there is ISIS, um, yeah, yeah, nine one one. Yes, but but even more, even more, the protection of Jesus 
um, is really what counts. Wow. Man, you guys have said some real profound things. I want to give a follow-up question. Uh, there's something that you said that really got my attention. We have so much research, there's so much knowledge available, but the depth, but Batunde said, I'm a, someone in fourth grade, I don't know if you said that or him, someone in fourth grade back home, fourth grade Southern school class back home, have a lot more depth um, of scriptures, of the word at times, even maturity than an adult here. Why, why do you think that's the reason when there's just so much availability of resources and what can we do differently? I think, you know, we, we will always remember not to, so for those of people who listen to us who don't have that problem, it's possible that in their church, everything is fine. And there are some churches, but when we look at that yeah. in proportion, we will say we can generalize. And so I think that, I think when people have, so we had, uh, yesterday was Thanksgiving and we had the Thanksgiving dinner at the basement of the church. And because I was an international student who had understood what it meant to be alone during Thanksgiving when everybody would go meet their family and you're just in the dormitory. That was what happened my first semester in uh, doing PhD. So we I challenged our church and we have, we invited the students who are, who are around to come to the church and we provided food. And probably we had 40, maybe 35, 40 students and a few of our people joined them. And when they finished the food, as I saw people dumping the trash in the trash can, it dawned on me again how much waste we generate in this part of the world. And I, I want to use that as an illustration to say that sometimes when you have a lot of things, there's a tendency for you to just pick things and not really consume them. So you want to have a taste of this, you want to have a taste of this, and at the end, you just pinch them and throw them away. And I think sometimes people do that to scripture and to God's word. You have them NIV, RSV, ESV, you have Logos Bible <clears throat> software, you have ebook, you have audio Bible and all those things. And the tendency is to just take a little pinch and pinch here and pinch there. I remember when I, you know, when I was doing my master's degree, it was done at the uh, university, University of Jos in Nigeria. The department had a library which was owned by a professor, uh, an American professor, Danny McCain, had moved his books to the departmental place so that those of us who are studying religious studies could have dictionaries of New Testament to use and Greek Bibles, which the library never had. So I remember getting, every time we get there, I'm looking for books, I'm reading and I'm consuming, I'm borrowing overnight, trying to work on things. Now I have all these books here in my office and sometimes for weeks, I don't even have time to open one of them. So I think sometimes that's what happens uh, in, in a place like this. And I mm -hmm. will say that the best that we can do is for the pastors to continue, those of us who come from other parts of the world, to tell them how important to talk about the urgency, how important it is for people not just to pinch things, but to stay with it for a while. I think... And that's what I tried to do recently with, with scripture to just stay with it. You know, even if you don't understand everything, just read it again and, and stay with it. So when, when we begin to encourage people not to be too microwaved, in the, you know, we live in this very fast world. Everything is microwave. Everything is instant this, instant that. The tendency is for people to look for instant Bible study that we just deposit in their mm -hmm. spirit. And it doesn't work. You cannot have instant baby. You have to wait for the gestation period. And for anyone carrying anything that is of destiny, it has to spend, we have to spend some time. Spending time with the Lord is not something that you can do in three minutes. So, so when we begin to encourage people to do that, and then maybe for some of them to see some of us, uh, our lifestyle, and I've had people say that, about some of our Africans and other people, our Korean brothers, for example, they will take time to pray. Five in the morning, they are awake and they are praying. And people are like, what are they praying about again? Praying, everything. We remind them of what the scripture says. And when they see the impact of that prayer, then they may say, okay, like Jesus' disciple went to him. 
his disciples went to him and said, teach us to pray. They noticed he was, prayer was much more than just rehearsing something, it was a deep stuff. So I think that that would be something that could change as, as more people from the global south are involved in ministry here and are bold enough to bring that gift to the body, not afraid, but bringing it as something that is a gift and encouraging people to receive it, then I think we will be able to get what you're talking about. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I think to add a little bit on that, um, uh, so the, a story is told of uh, somebody who went and saw um, a caterpillar, uh, you know, when they stop eating and they they quell themselves and they become, in, they get into this cocoon um, and it's like they were struggling in there and they went and just opened the holding to free it, you know, so that it doesn't struggle. And after a few minutes, it died. Um, and the moral of the story is that it's important to struggle in life a little bit because that is what makes you stronger. Um, I think uh, if we are not careful in a culture of affluence, when we have all that we will ever need, um, I'm looking at you guys' libraries. I I have, gosh, many books, not 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 here, but in the op on the opposite side of the room too. And I'm looking at them. I'm like, when was the last time I actually pulled a book? Um, and I think when people have this kind of affluence in terms of um, materials that we need, in terms of personnel, right? So every pastor has a church. One, I remember, Remember, I pastored 14 churches, you know, and that meant that for three months, that church never got to see me until three and a half months were over. Then I would go there again and give them communion. It was hard. What happens when people are living like that is they, because of the struggle, they learn to be strong. They learn to preach. They learn to lead Bible studies. They learn to teach Sunday school. It's just the only way to survive. Um, but when you have your pastor who is a leader of worship, who is going to pray for you every time, you can just make a phone call and say, Pastor, hey, we need you here. We are sick. <laughs> you know, or hey, what, what are we going to do with the children's time? Pastor is here. Um, Nothing wrong with uh, having a pastor to a church or actually three pastors to one church. Um, but the tendency is people relax. And so that is why you will meet a congregation where people have been in the church for a long time. They don't know how to pray. They don't know how to read scripture out loud. They don't know how to lead a Bible study or a Sunday school class. Not their fault, but it's because there is so much given to them that they have not had time to struggle so that they can flap their wings until they are an actual butterfly that can fly. And so I think, uh, Velma, when you are asking how does ministry look different here and and this this actually speaks to what Tunde was saying about my dissertation on discipleship is one of my biggest goals is to um is to urge people is to stir people to take active roles not because the pastor is not available or the pastor can't do it but because you actually need it for yourself you need, you need this for yourself. Nobody can be a disciple on your behalf. Nobody can, can preach the word of God on your behalf. Nobody can do missions on your behalf. We have all been called. And so just, just making sure that people understand all these comforts should not make us um, weak and um, non-involved in what is going on around us. Wow, man, so much wisdom in the room, so much wisdom. I'm going to switch gears a little and uh, 
be a little specific uh, as Africans, and, and this is not a general life thing, but one of the things I've seen among several of my African brothers and sisters who in ministry will come here and maybe are wanting to do ministry. The tendency is uh, to focus only on Africans. And I know there are people that God has called to the diaspora, whether it's wherever, North America, Europe, and God has called them to just reach the Africans in those areas. There are people with those specific kinds of calling. But I also know that there are times when uh, there are Africans will come and that is the focus, not because uh, God is the one leading them, but it's like, that's what I'm comfortable with. What would you say to that? What would you... Well, I, I, th I think... You want to to yes. Because I know you might have more to say on this. Um, I, I think you have said it well, Velma. It's comfort right? We all like some comfort. It's very uncomfortable when you are speaking to people and they're like, say that again, say that again. <laughs> you actually want to say it to your people <laughs> who are saying amen instead of say that again, right? Um. So, so comfort is one of the things that uh, make us uh, do that. But but other than that, um, there is also the reality of, are you going to be allowed the audience? Um, is someone willing to share their pulpit with you? Um, so so there, there, there are different dynamics of that. Uh, for some people, yes, they are going to where it's comfortable. But I think for some people is, who's going to allow you the space? Because... You always have to find, um, uh, what would we call it? Um, is it a, a goodwill person? Um, there was a name. A person uh, of peace. Person of peace. Yes, yes. A person of peace who is willing to vouch for you and say, I know Velma, she is a lover of Jesus, and I know that she's capable um, of doing ministry here. And that's why I'm honestly grateful to the United Methodist Church because it's one of the few churches in uh, in the diaspora that is willing to say, we believe in your ability, we believe in your ministry, we believe in your calling, and we recognize your ordination to do this work. Um, and, and they are not shy to say that we believe these pastors have what it takes to do ministry here. And so um, all this to say that it's it's easy to to do um, to to I, I think every time when a movement starts, it's always easier to go to the known. Um, I think this happened even with the New Testament church. Um, when the Christians broke from uh, Jerusalem, they went, to other towns, but they were evangelizing other Jews in those towns, right? Yeah. Um, until I think Paul is the one who came and he was an apostle to the Gentiles and everybody was like, what? Um, you remember the, the, the situation they had with um, the, 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 the church. I think it was the church in Jerusalem who was like, come and explain to us, what is that again you are doing? Like you are actually sitting down and eating with uncircumcised Greeks. Um, and Paul was like, yeah, yeah. And so it takes, it takes a few people who believe God is calling them beyond um, to do that. And, and God anoints them to do that. But I think, I think what I would say, Velma, is that we should be willing when the Lord calls us into that to not cower and, and be afraid but to move in the authority of Christ to whatever other context God is calling us. That's awesome. I wanted to just jump and shout, but I'm like self-control. <laughs> I mean, that was so good. But then you have some things, some thoughts to add. Yeah, he, she's already told us everything about it. I, I think it's just, when, when you look at it, generally, 
people like to go to places where they will be celebrated rather than tolerated. I like to go to a place where someone is going to say, welcome, pastor. And he's not going to look down on me and say, where did you say you went to school again? Did you, is that school accredited? Is it affiliated? Is it what? Is it, you know? And I have learned over time that there's more to pastoring than having good English, you know, speaking good English or even preaching good sermons. I remember one of our classes at Asbury earlier on, uh, we, we went to Korea and uh, South Korea actually with a group. And I remember telling some of my friends, listening to late Paul Yongicho, who at that time had the largest single congregation. I'm like, his preaching is not even as good as the preaching of uh, a youth group leader at my church in Nigeria. That was what I said. But I came to that conclusion, it's, there's more to pastoring people than just being able to preach. So, so I think that if people remember that, then they're able to welcome ministers that don't, they may not even understand their accent and their language, but they know that this person has been called, is anointed to be a pastor. We would like to work with him. We would like to submit ourselves and cooperate together and do ministry. And what I've seen is that churches that do that, they they can see the difference. But churches that just speak ministers because, oh, he looks like us, so we can stay with him. I have examples of such churches, they're almost dead. Because it's all about, okay, the familiar things. We don't want to leave our comfort zone. So these pastors are not going to challenge us. They're not going to tell us something strange. They're not going to tell us to come pray, chain prayer, you know, People don't like those kind of things. You know, I was raised in, a, in a, a denomination where every month, apart from the weekly ones that they have, they gather at a place and you, you probably have 500 to a million people gathering on a Friday night and they are praying and singing. It's common in Lagos, Nigeria, to see all these young people come to sing. Some of them don't even have a seat. They are standing for seven, eight, nine hours jumping and dancing and singing and praising God. Some of them walked for miles to get to that place. And just like Susan talked about, that those struggles in their lives are the things that have made them strong. And rather than being discouraged, not that we don't have depression and anxiety, it's just that people have too many things to, to deal with. They're praising God, they're worshiping God, they're praying. They pray those things out of their lives and they can't even remember. They don't have the time for that. So I think these are some of the gifts that if people are, are hospitable enough, and when I mean hospitality, I don't just mean say, oh, come, let's take a picture. When you wear your clothes, you say, oh, this is a very good, uh, I don't know what my wife, they used to call it uh, costumes. They call your, your clothes, the clothes you wear to church. Every Sunday, someone is calling it a costume. You know, it's like you're just wearing this to, to show up something it's like this is my normal dress that I go to church with. So when people learn to appreciate what you have and what you bring, rather than saying, okay, let's just keep this person the next two years, let them just bring us a real minister. This one, we don't know what they gave us, but let them bring us a real minister. So those are some of the struggles that we face. Uh, and that's why you hear people go stay with their people. Uh, well, during Christmas, the pastor gets all these gifts in some of the places nobody remembers to even say Merry Christmas to the minister. You know, so those are some of the things that make people to want to go to the, the what they are familiar with, what they know, what they enjoy. And so 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 that's what that's a major challenge today, even in the US and for some of our friends in other places, they've said that too. It has continued to be a major challenge for them that they see. And so we continue to push in, push in and wherever we're accepted, we go there. Wherever we're not accepted, Jesus said we should dust our feet and get out of the place. <laughs> so that's what some of us have been doing, what some of us have been doing uh, for a while. Wow, thank you so much. Somewhere I got interrupted there. Somebody was calling and I was trying to reject the call and then I said I accepted the call. So. <laughs> Okay, thank you all. So what would you say to an African, uh, maybe an Asian, a Korean pastor who is here that God has called and they know that God has called them to all ethnicities in this nation? 
or maybe in Europe, but they are really struggling because of how challenging it is. What would you tell them? Not to give up, you know. Um, I really like what Tunde said. Ministry is more than preaching. And so when we, or, or ministry is more than being smooth with language. Um, and so when we move beyond that, we are able to see gifts of people. We are able to see a peaceful spirit. We are able to see a good manager of God's resources. We are able to see a good leader who's leading people into a love of Jesus Christ. We are able to see somebody who's good at resolving conflict just because their spirit is so calm. We are, we are able to see someone who's loving all these children into the kingdom, not, not by blasting scriptures to them. I mean, sharing scriptures is good, but more than that, building relationships. Um, and so I believe when God sends you somewhere, um, even though you might face resistance for some time, um, God gives you the tools. God helps you navigate the road. Um, I don't know about your you all's experiences, but I know there are places I have gone to here and you know, the DS comes and says, I brought you the most wonderful pastor. <laughs> Welcome her. People are like, yay, welcome. <laughs> and you can tell they are really struggling, you know. Um, but after one, two, three months, they are like, oh my gosh, tell them to never take you out of here. We love you. We love your ministry. We love what you're doing. We, we, we see ourselves in you. It's the same faith. It's the same Christ. Um, and, and so I think if you would be chickened out uh, on that first week when everybody is coming and <laughs> yeah, um, trying hard to tolerate you. Um, and, and I think we have become so aware of uh, people who are really trying hard and, and people who are actually embracing Many times I'm very gracious with people because I'm thinking, yeah, they are not sure who I am. They are not sure, um, um, you know, how I'm going to fit in in their context. Um, but but I give them grace. I give them grace and I, and I pray. And within time, God, because God is the one who calls us you know, uh, impacts it in them that it is really more than how people look. It is more about, remember the story of Samuel when he was going to anoint the king and God was saying, no, 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 that skip the physical appearances. I look deeper than that. And I believe it's the thing with ministry. God looks deeper. And for the people that he has endowed with the gifts and grace is for ministry, um, I would say, keep on keeping on. Yeah, I was trying, you know, I was talking about visiting Young Church Church and I didn't conclude my thoughts just to follow up with what Susan was talking about, where I said, you know, I'm far away theologically from Young Cho, you know, faith and charismatic and uh, health and wealth gospel. But you know, it's a it's a it's a denominator, it's a church that has thrived over the years. And I remember going there and I said, well, that there, there has to be more to this growth than just preaching. And to see the amount of things that they did going to some of the past pastors, they have these cell groups where the ministers go to visit people at home, small church kind of things, neighborhood churches, follow-up and prayers all the night. You know, everybody comes at five in the morning. They have another group at six. So I came, came out with that conclusion. Much more than just preaching and smooth talk. There has to be the prayer. There has to be the follow-up. There has to be the genuine love for people, which when, which we see with many of our people from Asia, with, with pastor, 
they, they love the people. Our African brothers know that they have to go visit and sisters visit in the hospital, talk to people, wait patiently for them. And like Susan said, sometimes they will come and say, we don't know this pastor, whether he's qualified or not. Someone came to me one time and said, you know, we don't, I don't know, don't call me again. We don't want anyone calling us. We, we have children that are older than you. Don't call us. You can't take care of us. Because I followed up to say, oh, I no. don't see you in church. How are you doing? And I'm like, okay, 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 okay. But you know, after after some years, the same people don't want you to leave. The same people are willing to keep you. They talk to everybody that is needed to say, we want this person to remain here. And, and after months, they are still kind of like, oh, we really miss this pastor. So so I would say to someone who is feeling discouraged to say, like, like Susan said, is God sending you? And if he sent you, he will back you up, he will support you. And I used to have a pastor who says there's a difference between those who were sent and those who just went. And uh, you <clears> know, <throat> so so when 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 you have those challenges, is to remember whether you were sent by God. And if you're sent by God, is to hold on and keep the prayer. Maybe some spiritual warfare going on there, like we say in Africa, you may need to bind some demons somewhere, and maybe the eyes of the people will be opened. But those are some of the gifts that we bring to the body of Christ, being able to challenge spiritual forces. Uh, you can call them psychological forces, but whatever it is hindering people from receiving the gospel of Christ, we should not be afraid of confronting those spiritual entities in the spirit and taking authority over them so that our people can be free to then listen to God's, the gospel of Christ. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, uh, doing ministry in the diaspora, the cultures are different. And at times, even the theology are different. You just talked about the example of, of Younger Church Church. How, how, how do you stay culturally relevant as you do ministry here in the diaspora, but then theologically, uh, without compromising your theology? Uh, what are some of the things that are like, oh, these are my non-negotiables? And how do you do that? Bringing the discipleship major to, to open all the ground for them. <laughs> um, well, I I think um there is something Steve Bevans uh talks about in his book Constance in Context. Um and he talks about bold humility. So be bold, be bold. Uh, because you are carrying the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, it has power. It has authority. But be humble. <laughs> be humble and recognize that um, you are a student of culture. You know, you don't know everything. So be ready to listen to people. Um, let people guide you and show you honestly sometimes it's the children and young people who teach me so much about culture um and 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 really about context because they don't have as much filters yes you know how to say don't, don't say that to pastor no they are gonna say it to the pastor <laughs> <laughs> they are the ones who will tell you, um, why are you doing this? You're like, oh, well, uh, shouldn't I do this? Then they will tell you why you shouldn't do what you're doing. Um, and so in terms of the biblical mandate, be bold. In terms of contextual things and cultural things and how to navigate the do's and don'ts from an emic perspective, I think... Um, be humble, I would say. Yeah. Awesome. I guess that sounds like the same thing I wanted to say is to just be willing to learn. Uh, so coming to a different context, just be willing to learn and be gracious when, when people tend to push back. I think that sometimes people say things out of uh, ignorance not because they hate you or because, you know, they are racist. You know, we live in a world where everything has been, 
it's easy to, to just give people labels, you know. When you give people labels, you stop them from engaging with you. So when someone says something, instead of trying to understand why they said what they said, it's cheaper, much easier, less tasking to say they are racist or they are liberals or they are wicked. You know, you just shut down the discussion. But if you're willing to learn, then you may need to take, pay attention to why they did what they did and maybe ask some questions. You may, you may feel a sense of sympathy for them, not knowing that there are aeroplanes in Cameroon, for example, uh, someone thinking that you must have been swimming from Kenya for a couple of months to get to America. And there's very serious, even when you answer in a very sarcastic way, like, oh, yes, I, I've been swimming. And they're like, oh, how long would that take? Oh, it took me about two months. You see that they're sincere. <laughs> it's just that they are sincerely wrong. And so rather than getting angry and, and just calling people name, is to sp spend some time with them. I was told that it's easier to judge someone when you've not sat down to listen to their stories. And so listening to people's stories, uh, the church that I'm presently at, is this is my fourth year now that I'm trying to make some changes. Uh, but for the past three years plus, I've been listening to stories, trying to find out things that are important. I met with a, a man who served the same church about 15, 20 years ago. And, you know, I asked him, he said, oh, there is a tree there. Don't go near that tree. That was the first thing he told me. I'm like, tree? What is the relationship of a tree to growing a church? But 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 trust me, that can mess up your church. If you keep arguing over cutting down a tree for the next six months and everybody's angry, you will be in trouble. So I think paying attention and learning becomes very important. But I also think that declaring, like, like Susan talked about being bold, declaring where you stand about on, on issues. You may think that people will hate you for that, but I think people appreciate people who can stand for something. And uh, for me as a person, everyone around me, they know me as uh, an African person. I'm very traditional. I'm very orthodox, use the word orthodox. But I'm also someone who believes that the gospel is for everyone. And so my duty is to guide the people to be hospitable. And being hospitable is not just about saying, oh, we have somebody black in our church. You know, that's what people think when they want to talk about inclusivity or hospitability. Oh, we, I have a friend who is black. Oh, oh, I went to Kenya two weeks, some 10 years ago when I was in high school. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about being genuine in the real sense of it and being willing to accept other people's stories to be part of your own story. So rather than, you know, bifurcating and saying, this is my story and this is Verma's story, when we begin to be hospitable, people's stories become part of our own story. And that does, doesn't does just happen in a day. And so I think that sitting down with leadership of the church, you know, talking together, letting them know your story, where you're coming from, you know, why you hold some beliefs, may be very important. What are your bases? Some of the things that I, I owe very dearly to me may not be Bible, but there are, there are stories that are behind those things. Why I, I pay, pay special time to praying, why I think I take time for discipleship. There are the reasons why I do some things with my kids because it was done to me. You know, I didn't like how it was done to me. And now my children have to pay the price for that. I remember <laughs> explaining why in my confirmation <laughs> class, everybody has to sign and someone said, why should they sign? They have to give it to their parents. The parents have to sign and they have to commit to attending some of the sessions and the, and the you know, what do you call them? The sponsors or mentors have to come. And someone asked me, I said, well, I, I can't say it's in the Bible, but I have a story. So I told them my story, how I was baptized as a child. And I have all these people who signed on my certificate. I've never met them since, since they signed that certificate. That was the last time they probably saw me. And now I'm almost 50 years old. I don't know them. I see the names on my certificate. They have never been part of my journey. And I said, that's not what the church did when people were baptized, when they were bringing their kids, there were those sponsors and godparents who took care of the children and discipled them until they prepared them for, for confirmation. 
So when I said, you know, if you're going to make me, I have to baptize this baby. I want to know who are the sponsors and I want to see them. They have to know what they're involved in. So there, there are things that we do because of the, the experiences we've had and making people know those experiences may help them to understand us better and they don't see you as being a big art or something, but because of your story. And so I think there are things that are non-negotiable. The word of God is non-negotiable for me. The authority, the lordship of Christ is non-negotiable. The, you know, the salvation of our souls, people must, they have to be led to Christ, accepting the work that was done on the cross. That is non-negotiable to culture, whether African culture or Western culture. But I think there are other things that may fall within that area where we can negotiate and explain things to people but paying attention to God's word, the authority of God's word, uh, I don't think those are negotiable for me as a person. Awesome, thank you. One of the things is the, the rate at which believers from the global south are coming to North America and Europe is amazing. Some are coming as students, some are coming as professionals, but many of them are coming with just so much passion for God and they want to make a difference here when they come the same way they were making back home. How do you think the church in the global South can intentionally prepare believers, Christians, as they get ready to transition to other cultures so they are effective in the work that they come to do? You want me to start it? Yeah. Well, it still gets back to, well, there are many reasons why people come here. I think that the idea of trying to stop people from coming here is over. It's not going to work. People are going to come. I said to a friend of mine not too long ago, he, he's been a missionary and he was actually born in Nigeria and he came to visit and we're talking about it. I said, you know, when your dad came to Nigeria, nobody ever asked them when they are going back. Why do I find people asking me when I'm going back? As, as though they don't want me. They're like, just get out of here, get out of here. I said, no. <laughs> For some of us, we came, you know, came here just to do something, get your education and get back home. The story changed. And if you submit yourself to the Lordship of Jesus, you don't care what other people say eventually. It is what Jesus says that becomes the ultimate uh, focus for you. And so sometimes we have that pushback where people say, what is this person coming here to do again? Are you sure you're going to go back? And you're like, yes, of course, I'm going back. Now you're not going back. And somebody is angry because you're not going back. But they're not angry when other religion people come they're not angry when uh, the, what is they call M M12 or M something, those people, cult people in uh, South America, they don't, yeah. they don't, they don't get angry with those ones, but they get angry when the pastor doesn't go back. So, but let's leave those people aside and see that they are very ignorant or maybe proud. Uh, so let's leave those ones aside. But I think that when people are coming here they have to know they are coming to a different environment and they are strangers. And so when you're a stranger, there's a saying in my part of Nigeria, they say that when a chicken, a native chicken gets to a new destination and you put it on the ground, <laughs> it lifts one leg up and put the other on the ground and looks around to be sure he's in safe zone before he puts the second leg down. So, so I think that I, I will I will argue that people have to do that. Don't assume that you have come to your hometown or your home country. So the pastors may be the people who need to do that preparation. Or for those of us who are already here, when we go home and we hear about people who want to come here, spend time with them to mentor them. Tell them, you know, there are so many things. I remember someone, uh, that story, I don't know if some of you still remember, someone was in at a seminary in Kentucky and was exhausted in the sun, the heat of May or June and collapsed. And I have these two Nigerians who came to leave, spend holiday with me. They rush down there, they're laying hands and they're praying, speaking in tongue on this guy. This guy is exhausted. They, in, in, in Kentucky, they were supposed to call 911 and they will come get this guy and take care of him. But the first instinct was to, hold this guy down. They didn't call anybody. They are speaking in tongue and praying and laying hands. And when they came back to me and told me this, I wasn't around. I said, God saved you. You will have been arrested. Obstruction. If something had happened to that guy, you would be in trouble. 
the first thing to do is to call 911. You may begin to pray and speak in tongues. That's fine. But first call the 911. You know, so people not knowing that I had a student here who drove a car. He's been driving in Nigeria. He came, got a car and drove. He doesn't have a driver's license. He doesn't have an insurance for the car. He's driving. The police was behind him and he intensified his speed. And then they started chasing him. He ran out of the town. I was running on the highway. And they chased him for 35 miles, three cars. They had to throw something on his on his car, overtake him and throw, and the car rolled over for them to get him, got him to the hospital and then got him to jail. When I went to bail him at the jail, I asked him a question, where do you think you were going? Because it's, it takes, from my part of Nebraska to the end of Nebraska, it's about nine hours drive. And I said to him, there will be, your gas is, you're going to be out of gas. So do you think you're in Nigeria where when the police chases you for like 10, 15 minutes, they don't have enough gas, so they will leave you alone, hoping to get you another day? I said, it doesn't happen around here. So I think that if he had had some orientation to say, you know, when the, the car of the police is behind you, you just have to stop where he comes from in my part of Nigeria, the police comes in front of you, not at your back. And they pull out their gun and cock the gun, point it at you. Then you know you have to stop. But here, they don't do that. They are behind you and they put on their light, hoping that you park and pull over and stop. So these are little, little things that can get people into trouble. So I think that helping to mentor those kind of people, letting them know that God is sending them here, but they have to first learn, just like Jesus staying for 30 years, learning the culture, the customs, before he then eventually came out to talk about the spirit of God is upon me and all those things. The spirit has always been on him. Uh, but, you know, he. the Bible says in Luke chapter 4, he went home with his parents and became subject to them. And I think it's important that people have to become subject to whatever culture that they go to. And they have to prepare that before they go out to say, okay, where am I going to? What are some of the things? What are the things I need to learn about the churches there? Don't just say, oh, all these churches are too dry. They are dead because they don't jump and dance and sweat. It means they are dead. It doesn't really mean so because sweating is not, is not equal to the spirit, even though many parts of Africa, we equate it for it, but that's not true. There are, people could be sweating and the spirit is not there. <laughs> and we can go to a place where people are singing their hymns quietly and we can feel the spirit of God there. And so learning those things may be very helpful for people who are coming in here so that they, they don't become too zealous or overzealous and pushing people away from them. Okay, I'm preaching now. No, that's good. That's good stuff. <laughs> Susan, you have some extras to add? Gosh. Um, <laughs> I, I just wanted to push back on Tunde and say, you have to sweat for the spirit to be on you, brother. What what kind of doctrine is that? <laughs> I don't mean you can't sweat. I just, now. I just no, you don't stand to... still and tell us there is any spirit in you. No, the spirit okay? can move you to so... quietness. It can make you calm. It can be a still, small voice. We mustn't be dancing and sweating and rolling on the ground every time <laughs> because that happens with the masquerades in my village, and they are not. And the Holy Spirit is not upon them. They sweat and they dance and they roll on the ground. I just want people to remember that. <laughs> just messing up with my Pentecostal brother. Anyway, um, yeah, I think I think those things that you're saying are very very accurate. <clears throat> um, in fact, I had a call from a friend recently, and they told me how. They had been driving through town and a police officer was following them. <clears throat> and they thought the guy is on his way to something. But then whenever they turned, the police turned too. And so they decided to go to a different route because they weren't even sure what this guy is up to. And they went in circles and circles in circles and the guy kept following and so she started racing across town and the policeman started racing across town and when they finally stopped 
the of course the police officer was now smiling and so he came out and they were shouting and they thought maybe it was a drugs person or something cuffed her um she had a little baby at home so um yeah but they took her in it, it took uh, a lot of intervention from um people around to say no 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 this is a, this is not who you think it is this is just an innocent person who wasn't anyway so th those are very important uh, i think the only thing i can add to that is, is um how the churches can prepare people coming here. So I understand that not everybody coming here is a pastor. Not everybody coming here is officially a missionary, uh, but people are coming here as believers and lovers of Christ. I think uh, it's important for um, churches to remind them that um, to be a witness of Christ you do not need to be trained theologically. You do, you do not need to um, be endowed with great wisdom and philosophical arguments. You just need to be willing to share your story about who Jesus is to you. And I think that's what happened in the early church. They just shared their story. They said, there is this guy, guys, you need to check him out because he is awesome. And that's how the gospel spread. I think, I think many times people feel inadequate, you know, like how much do I know? Um, how can I engage these learned and smart people in, in this conversation without realizing that it's really not about, it's, well, I mean, it, it matters what we say, but that is not it. It's about the spirit of God living in us. He's the one who does the convicting. Um, he's the one who um, uh, convicts people of sin and judgment. Um, and so ours is just to share our story and who Jesus is and what he has done to us. I think another faulty um, understanding that has been there uh, in yesteryears years is that to do missions, you have to come from um, a place of those who have to a place of those who don't. And so we, you know, we had people who passed for mission projects. This one looks like one we can give. And it that's not how it needs to be. Um Mission is not so much about giving stuff as it is about sharing, um, sharing, you know, who we have come to experience in Christ. And so encouraging people to just come share your story with everybody you meet. Um, don't get into arguments. You won't win those. But be attentive to the prompting of the spirit um, and just share what God gives you to share with people. Okay. I'm going to ask this last question and then I'm going to let you both just give your last final thoughts. Uh, looking at the body of Christ in America, and that includes everybody, the Native Americans, the Caucasians, the African Americans, and those from the diaspora living here, I believe that the church is so gifted with the resources. How can the church benefit from what it has, its diversity to, to become a stronger missions force back into the world. Well, I, I would say that everyone has something to offer. And the church, when, when we use the church now in this general sense in, in the US and in the West in general, should know that they have a lot so, so that you're not just projecting one aspect of yourself. And I am uh, I'm not a fan of the diversity, whatever they call it, uh, diversity, equity, and all those stuff. Those are just, those are just, for me, are just social cliches or political, whatever. 
I've, I've had people who put that at their door poles on their wherever you get in, you still feel so discriminated. You still feel they want to use you to achieve something. So I, I think let's leave that aside and ask the question. This is a bowl of, I did a paper not too long ago. This is a bowl of fruit with different types of fruits and colors. And the, the doctors and the nutritionists, nutritionists have told us that we should always try to take all these colors and mix them together to have a balanced diet of fruit. Yep. I, I, if we use that principle, that is what we should be able to do in America. Rather than some people say, oh, these people have come, what are they coming here to do? Is to say, oh, we welcome the gift that they bring. And how can we integrate that gift uh, I, I I was, I'm, my ordination is in the Anglican church and it's, it's been a war for the past few years between the African church of North America and the Anglican church, church of Nigeria. Because church of Nigeria wants to have his own stuff, wants to do his own outreach, reach out to his own people, sing their language, dance their stuff and be happy with themselves, stay in their comfort zone. The Anglican Church of North America are saying, come on, we want you to be part of us. But the Nigerians are like, well, you want us to be part of you, but you don't want us to have equal voice and equal everything. We feel discriminated, so we want to go our own way and do our own stuff. And what is that? There is friction. There is disagreement. And the mission of Christ is left unattended to while all this politics is going on. So I think that if the church can sit down and say, God has brought us to a time like this, let's take all these gifts together, let's integrate them or bring them together, whatever name you want to use, whether you want to use the mosaic, whether you want to use the melting pot, I don't care. I just want you to use all these things, put them together because they have a purpose and then sit down and coordinate it properly and use it to then bless the rest of the world. I think that would be a very good thing. That is not happening yet. Yeah. Yeah. I think there is beauty in diversity. There is beauty in difference in, in um having all those giftings from different cultures and different ethnicities. Um I think it's in the book of Corinthians that Paul talks about different parts of the body. Um, and so there's the eyes and there's the mouth and there is the ears. Um, and, you know, an eye can't think of itself so great and say, I am sufficient for the body and, and I'm, I'm going to be the body by myself. Mm. No, you, you can't breathe as an eye. You can't hear as an eye. You can't eat food as an eye. You need everybody else. And so I'm thinking there was wisdom when God was making all of us like this and we should just embrace each other. The health of the church depends on us embracing and accepting our brothers and sisters from other parts of the world and realizing that God has gifted us differently for the edification of the church. It is actually for our nourishment and not for our undoing. I think our undoing is when we start thinking one group, my group is better suited to do this than everybody else. That's so, so good, man. I'm going to let you all give your final thoughts uh, on what it means to be on missions in the diaspora or just any thoughts that come to your mind from just all these conversations. And uh, we will wrap it and give it a day. Anybody wants to go first? We are in the last days. I always tell people that, of course, that continues. By the time we are dead and the new generation will come up, they will still be in the last days. So, but... It is very exciting to be born and to be alive at a time like this, where the barriers have been broken down, technological-wise, transportation-wise, and the rest of it. And so it's time to allow the Holy Spirit to use the different parts of the body of Christ working together. I, I talked the other day, talking with someone about partnership. And I said, when I says partnership, I know where you're going to. I said, don't go there. I say, it's not about sending money to anywhere. That's not what I'm talking about. 
you know, if we want to use Paul Hebert's language, using the hermeneutical community, where we're all together, you know, working together. And I said, it's not about just asking people and putting some black people in the midst of some white people or have all these black people and sandwich one white person and say, that has diversity. I said, no, we're just, that's playing into the gallery. Real working together will happen when we learn to accept the body of Christ, like Susan talked about, and not just enduring one another, but enjoying one yeah. another, whereby people bring their stuff with their various accent, wonderful. They are singing in the various languages, and we're appreciating them. We're not just taking selfie and videos like people do every time that say they are doing worship. I say, what kind of worship are you doing that you're still comfortable taking videos up and down? Oh, I like uh, their dancing. That's just, you're just doing social social media stuff. You're not worshiping. When people are really worshiping, they forget about their photographs and cameras. They're just lost. Or like someone said, oh, we're praying. And somebody is videoing you praying on the mountain. You're not yet praying. That's not how to pray. So I, th I think we have to leave all those all those virtual signaling, is that what they call it? And sit down, you know, and do the real stuff. Enjoy one another. Listen to each other's story. Visit with one another. I'm yet to, I know some people must have told you, oh, I would like to visit with you in your country. That's just talk. When you mean it, I know when you really mean it. And then we can travel. It's not about bringing money. That's, you're not doing any project. You're not building any houses. Just come and see how people worship in that culture and come back and be encouraged. I think when we start doing that, we're, we're enjoying one another. And once we're able to do that, it becomes easier for us to then work together. And what Susan was talking about, we can achieve it if we are willing to have it. And this is our opportunity. In, in the diaspora, we have a lot of mission work to do. The gospel needs to go around Many people, I'm surprised. Each time I talk to people who, who were raised in the U.S., some of them have never been to churches before. Some of them only went to church during a funeral service. You know, I'm like, I didn't know you. You are so ignorant like this, you know, even around you. So I think we have opportunities, but we can only do that when we learn from the community where we are and then give to that community the way they will want to be helped. You know, we won't force our cultures on them to force them to come pray six hours or you must do five hours of worship because that's what we do back home in Africa. No, we need to respect people and then bring the gift that we have to them. And it's going to be a great time of harvest. Amen. 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 Amen, Reverend Susan. Any last thoughts? Yeah, I think Tunde has said everything, honestly. Um, I'll just add and say, I think God is unto something beautiful in our age. Um, with this advancement of technology and communities coming together, God is unto something beautiful. It's up to the church to embrace what everybody brings. Um, and without pride, you know, if... If the Western church is endowed with resources, share it with others without feeling like, oh, look at those poor people, we have to go and help them. No, with an attitude of God has blessed us with this, we are going to share it with our brothers and sisters from other parts of the world who need this. And if it's the gift of prayer, I have always enjoyed how my Asian brothers and sisters especially from Korea, are so disciplined about their prayer life. Like Tunde was talking about waking up at 5 a.m. and going for prayer. Bring that and share it with the international church. Let the church wake up to pray, you know. And if, if maybe the Nigerians have the gift of community where everybody together embraces each other, Bring that and share it with others, not with judgment and condemnation, but just yeah. with, oh, we are happy to share with you this aspect of Christianity. Like Andrew Walls, I think um, in his book, um, um, okay, I won't remember, but uh, in one of his books, he shares about how this missionary who was going and coming back and going and coming back after every 50 years and meeting different expressions of faith. Mm -hmm. 
and then realized, oh gosh, it's not one thing. It's all these things together. And so the beauty of what we have right now is that this missionary, this terrestrial missionary that Andrew Wall <laughs> was imagining does not have to go back 50 years to come and witness something different. It's all here. So yeah. let's share this because this can only be for the benefit mm. of God's kingdom. Amen. Yes. Amen. Oh my. Woo! I felt like jumping and starting a yes. plan. This has been so awesome. Thank you both so much for sharing your wisdom. I believe that this is going to bless someone. Uh, but one thing I want to say, there might be somebody who jumps to this video and does not even have a relationship with God and doesn't even know what it means like to be in a relationship. So everything that they are listening is going to be above their head. Would any of you want to just lead them to Christ? Just tell them what does it mean to come to have a relationship with Jesus so they understand everything else about missions. I'll let the right reverend, um, right reverend. Dr. <laughs> Babatunde or Ladimeji do that. No, I, I, th I think that there, there's no formula about it, but I think that if you want to have a relationship with Jesus, he's already waiting for you. He said, I do, more than 2,000 years ago when he stretched himself on the cross and to die for your sin and for my sin. And all we need to do at this point is to say our own I do to what he has said. So and the way, best way to do that is to accept him in your heart that he died for you and put your faith in him and uh, receive him as Lord. And I can pray together with you today if you want to pray with me. And you can just uh, reflect and you can say these words, they're not magical words, but they're just kind of giving you a language uh, by saying, uh, Lord Jesus, I acknowledge myself as a sinner. and I know that you died for me on the cross of Calvary. I put my faith in you and I accept your offer of salvation. And I accept you as the Lord of my life to live my life for you and to do your will. In Jesus' name, let us pray. Heavenly Father, I pray for anyone today who is listening to us and who has been touched by some of the talks that we've had, but they don't have a genuine relationship with you or they used to have, and now they've departed from you and they want to come back home to say, I do to you. We pray together, three of us, putting our faith together and asking that your grace will be revealed to them and that they, as they open their hearts to you, that the Holy Spirit will do his work in them as they accept you, writing their names in the book of life, giving them eternal life as they make you their Lord of their lives. So we give you praise and we give you thanks because we have asked in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Wow, thank you. That's going to be a wrap for today, guys. If you like this, share it with someone, subscribe to this channel, and goodbye. See you next time. Bye. Okay, stop your recording.